Well, good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning worship service coming to you from the First United Methodist Church of Paxton. For those of you who are watching online or listening on the phone line, and I want to begin this evening, or this evening, I'm used to doing that for evening devotions. This morning, um, just I, I wanted to um, express condolences to the Purdue basketball fans to start out today. <laughs> And if anybody's an Ohio State fan, I'll include you in, in that too. But I did want to let you know that uh, I know Illinois starts their game a little after 11 this morning. And we're not, we're not going to cut the service short. But uh, if you want periodic updates, I'll have somebody get on their phone and give us scores every once in a while during my sermon. So, okay. As we uh, get started this morning, I want to remind those who are watching us on Facebook Live that there is a link there for you to record your attendance or just let us know in the messages that you're watching so that we can have a good idea about who is with us this morning for worship. And uh, there are some questions on that link that are related to the, uh, the sermon this morning, so you're welcome to take a look at those as well. Uh, we are doing our card mission for our older church members, and this week we're sending cards to Harriet Evans and Mary Rogers, and there are some cards on a table in the back of the sanctuary if you want to write a short note to these ladies, and you can leave the cards in the basket back there, and then we'll mail them from the church. So take time to send them a card. Um, we are following the, the protocols of our conference and uh, Bishop Beard, and now we are allowed to have up to 25% capacity in the sanctuary, which means up to 70 people, and that's especially important for planning for Easter services this year. We sent out a letter this week with information on Holy Week and Easter services, and a postcard followed that. Uh, we're asking people to please let us know which service you plan to come to on Easter if you want to come in person. And uh, if we reach the 70 limit at the 1030 service, we might have to ask a few people to shift to the 8 o'clock service, possibly. So it's important that we know that. Uh, we did not put a deadline on it, but it would be really helpful if we could know by next Sunday, which is Palm Sunday, uh, who is going to be with us on Easter and at which service. Um, and then uh, for Easter, we are planning two services at 8 and, 8 and 1030, and uh, we are going to have some special music and some other things in those services. We still are not allowed to sing yet, although those guidelines have been re reduced a little bit, but uh, we have to have 10 feet between people in order to sing, and I don't think we can do that if we get up to 70 people. So, so we're kind of working on that to see when we might be able to go back to having congregational singing in the service again. Uh, during Holy Week, we also are planning a Maundy Thursday service on April the 1st. That will be in person as well as online and on the phone line, and that's at 7 p.m. And then uh, there's no Community Good Friday service this year, but we'll do a special devotion during the, the uh, devotion time for Good Friday. And we are going to have a prayer vigil between the two starting about 8 o'clock on Thursday evening, April the 1st, and going until 7.30 on Good Friday evening, and you're welcome to just pick a time that you would like to pray, and we'll have some items in this letter going out this coming week that you can be praying about as we prepare for um, Easter this year. And, uh, and then I also want to mention we are doing an Easter egg hunt for the little ones in the church. It will be a socially distanced Easter egg hunt, safely prepared. And so if you have young children that you would like to bring for that, that will be at 9.15 on Easter Sunday, April the 4th. And uh, you can let us know ahead of time. It would be really helpful if you can let us know if you're bringing your kids so we know about how many kids to plan for for the Easter egg hunt. And then we are also doing an Easter dinner again this year that will be carry out only. And if you would like to receive a dinner, um, those can be picked up after the 1030 service that day, all the way up till about one o'clock in the afternoon. So uh, Cara Fitton is coordinating that and you can let us know if you'd like to receive a dinner so that she has a good number and she needs to know that by uh, the 30th, which is Tuesday of the week after Palm Sunday. Um, also want to remind you about the flowers for our worship services and uh, the flowers today are given to the glory of God and for Jason and Liz Bowen's 24th anniversary. So happy anniversary to Jason and Liz. Hey. 
And if you would like to provide flowers, you can call the office and leave a message for Judy Hastings, or you can fill out a slip on the bulletin board and uh, return that to her box, and those are $13 per week. Um, I believe we, we have a, a birthday with us today. Uh, Susan Whitebird is celebrating a birthday, and we have some other birthdays that are uh, listed in the, the weekly circuit rider coming up this week. Uh, Seth and Lindy Allen both have birthdays this coming week as well. So uh, we wish happy birthday, and Peggy Busey's is today too. We wish a happy birthday to all of these, these folks today and this week. Um, and then I would remind you, if you're with us in person this morning, we're following the protocols and uh, we are keeping distance between families, at least six feet, no congregational singing yet. Uh, you are welcome to do the responses, but please keep your masks on unless there's a medical reason that you cannot keep a mask on. And then if you have a prayer request, please write that out and get it to one of our health and safety team members and they will get it to me. Um, and the offering plates are scattered throughout the, the uh, sanctuary for your offering to go into. Um, and then if you need to use the restroom, please be sure that you use a paper towel to open the door and uh, wash your hands with soap and water at least 20 seconds before leaving the restroom. And of course, we're still not allowed to have any food served at the church, but you're welcome to bring your, your own water or drinks with you if you choose to. And we are reading through the Bible together. Uh, we're finishing up the book of Hebrews over the next couple of days and then starting into Galatians to finish out the month of March. And there will be a new Bible reading plan for the month of April uh, coming in the April newsletter. And we'll have that available uh, also next Sunday for those who are here in person. And finally, I want to just thank you again for your contri contributions to the church. The uh, March mission offering is going to the Nimble Fingers ministry. We had a blessing last Sunday of some of the Nimble Fingers items. And thank you for supporting their work as they bless people in our area at the hospital and uh, people all over the country through the, the prayer shawls for fallen soldiers as well. So thank you for your contributions to support them as well as for our uh, regular general fund offerings and building fund offerings. And then we're still collecting the plastic bottle caps for the FFA. The uh, masks for PBL students are still um, coming in if you want to bring any. And then the items for the food pantry and the IGA receipts that we're still receiving. So thank you for bringing those items in. I believe those are all the announcements that need to be made. And so at this time, I'm going to ask Jason um, to come forward and Liz and uh, share with us in our opening praise song, Death Was Arrested. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains My orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace is so free, watches over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested. 
Christ in my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your Pouring down on us, you have made us new, now life begins with you. Our Savior displayed, displayed on, on a criminal's cross, darkness, darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But, but then, then Jesus, Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. For oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new now life begins with you. Of all the redeemed, yes, we're free, free, forever, amen. In that blood to rest, in my life begins. Oh, we're free, free, forever, we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed, yes, we're free. Thank you, Jason and Liz, for sharing that wonderful song with us to get our service started this morning. Would you please join me now in our opening prayer? God of love and mercy, open our hearts to your presence as we worship you this day. Whether our prayers are filled with celebration and praise or with loud cries and tears, remind us that you are the source of our strength and the author of salvation. Give us the strength to respond faithfully to your transforming love, that the joy of your salvation might shine in and through our lives. Wipe away our sins, cleanse our hearts, and make us more like you as we surrender our lives to you in the strong name of our Savior Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to invite Michelle to come at this time, and she's going to share our children's time today. And so any of the kids that are watching, please uh, get near your screens so you can hear what Michelle has to share. Good morning. Good to see the kids that are here. Um, so in high school class, Sunday school class, we've been meeting, we've been talking a lot um, about this. Does anybody know what this is? It's a watch, that's right. What does a watch do? It tells you the time. Do you ever hear a clock or a watch go tick, 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 tick? Counts those seconds away, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours a day, and you have so much to do. We're talking with the high schoolers about how much they have to do. You've got school, you have sports, you have other activities, extracurriculars, you have homework, 
some of them have work, then you get home, and your parents say, clean your room, do some laundry, pick up the yard, and then you come to church and pastor says, read your Bible every day, pray every day, good grief. Do you ever tell your parents there's just not enough hours in the day? I can't do it. There's just, there's not enough time, right? Well, the Bible in Ecclesiastics 3 says, for everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven. So how do we get it all to fit in? In high school class, we've been, for Sunday school, we've been talking about time management. And today, oh my gosh, so hilarious. One of my students, I won't say who, you may be able to guess, said, I come in from school and I sit down on my glutes and I stay there. I thought, oh, so you can't get anything done because you're busy sitting on your glutes. For those that don't know, that's your bottom. He parks his bottom on the couch and he's done. He goes, yeah, I threw a load of laundry in and my mom said, put dishes in the dishwasher. I'm already doing laundry. So the 50 minutes while the laundry's washing, you're doing, he said, glutes. That's what I'm doing. I said, oh, okay. So maybe he could be doing homework during that time, reading the Bible during that time, praying during that time, cleaning his room during that time. We also had them look on their phones because it tells you how long you're on Snapchat, how long you were on your phone playing games. So we did that a couple weeks ago, five hours a day, seven hours a day. I was floored. Oh my gosh. So you have time. Somewhere in there, there's time to read the Bible, to talk to a friend about Jesus, to go visit a neighbor that's shut in, even if you're standing outside their window waving at him, to give him a card. There's time to do those things, because Jesus and the Bible already told us there is time for everything. You just have to manage it well. So let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the 24 hours a day that you bless us with every day, and we ask that you help us to use that to your will and to best serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Michelle, for sharing with our children this morning. And as we come to our prayer, joys, and concerns, I want to uh, lift up some new ones to you. Um, we've been praying for Ella Curry, and Ella is doing much better now. She had uh, been tested positive with COVID and also had strep throat. And uh, for about 10 days, she was sleeping about 21 hours a day. But she's doing much better now, and thank you for your prayers, those who've been praying. And I found out this week that uh, Avery has now also tested positive for COVID. So keep, keep the Curry family in your prayers as they go through this. Um, also learned that uh, Wilma Smith, Wilma and Jack are down in Florida. Wilma had a fall, and uh, she fractured her pelvis. And so she's in a rehab. I talked to Jack, and she, she's in rehab down there. And uh, he was just getting ready this morning to go over and see her, but keep them in prayer. They were planning to come back to Paxton next weekend, but now that's going to be delayed for a while. So keep them, keep them in your prayers. And then uh, Lois continues to need prayers as she recovers from her fall a few weekends ago. And uh, she's back at uh, Accolade now and pray for her healing. And then I also got word from Susie Shell that her brother went into the hospital this week and was put on a ventilator. Uh, but the good news is I heard from her this morning that he's off the ventilator now and recovering at the hospital. So please keep her brother in prayer. And we continue prayers also for Carol Ingold, who's recovering from a TIA a few weeks ago, and it's affected her vision. And then also Elna Maphis, I visited her, and she's having problems with her vision as well. So please keep both of them in prayer. Um, we also continue prayers for Pat Carlson, who's healing from the broken wrist that she suffered a few weeks ago. And uh, glad to know that Jackie's doing better and she's at home um, recovering from her fall and following therapy. So glad, glad to know she's doing better. Uh, Bonnie gave me an update this week on her brother Jim, who is in assisted living out in Portland, and his wife Barbara. Uh, Barbara had to be taken back to the hospital as her oxygen level dropped way down to about 74. And so they had to put her on oxygen, and uh, she's doing better, but still in the hospital, so keep them in your prayers. 
And then I talked to Jean Starkey this morning. Her friend Charles, that's been on our prayer list, um, has had six treatments as a follow-up to his cancer surgery a few months ago and may have to have another surgery. So keep, uh, keep Charles in your prayers. Uh, Mary Rogers is doing well. She had scans done this week and goes back to the doctor this coming week to get results and see how she's doing. So keep her in prayer that things are progressing well with her treatments for lymphoma. And then uh, Gary Ripsky's cousin's wife, Evelyn, is doing well, is now cancer-free, but their little great-grandson, Owen, is continuing with his treatments uh, with radiation and chemotherapy after his surgery last fall, so keep him in prayer. Also, Bill Mag continues to need prayers. He's at home. Uh, that's Julie's husband. Had to have toes amputated from his remaining foot, and about a year and a half ago, he had the other leg partially amputated uh, and from diabetes complications, so keep him in prayer for healing. And then we have uh, Marguerite Stegan's daughter, Melinda, who continues to need prayers with two inoperable brain tumors. Also, I ask prayers for others who are dealing with COVID, and uh, I got an update from my friends Rick and Cindy, and if you're on the devotions in the evening, you know that uh, Rick has been getting out with a walker and walking in the neighborhood some, and uh, they took some video of him actually grilling outside with a friend this past week, so he's beginning to be able to do more, so thank you very much for your prayers for them. Continued prayers also for Hunter uh, Crow and his girlfriend Emily, who are recovering from a serious accident last July, and they're both at home. And for Bonnie's neighbor Lita, still waiting to have surgery to remove an aneurysm from her brain, and her father is at home with her after having had COVID, uh, praying for him to be able to get off of oxygen. And then for our little ones that we continue to pray for, little Lincoln had another immun immunotherapy treatment this week and was able to go home, I believe it was on Friday, and really looked happy in the pictures. So thank you for your prayers for Lincoln. Uh, little Emma has another treatment, a maintenance treatment tomorrow, so keep her in prayer. And Maddie got to go home this week which is a major praise for their family and uh, they are back home again and thanking everyone they do have some more scans and tests coming up um, to see how she's doing after her uh, stem cell transplant bone marrow transplant about a month ago and the stem cells have been engrafting but they're going to do the test to see how well and hopefully she will be in remission from her leukemia but just praising God that she's back home my friend Tammy had her first chemotherapy treatment this week, and uh, she'll be having uh, several more of those treatments, so keep her in prayer. And she took a picture that she posted of her wrapped in the prayer shawl that uh, the nimble fingers had sent to her uh, to prepare her for these treatments, so thank you to them for that. Uh, continued prayers also for Ashley Williams Nazer's mother-in-law, Carol, as she is struggling with a cancerous mass behind her heart and lungs and congestive heart failure. And then for Bonnie Howard's sister-in-law, Minako, whose mother continues to be in the rehab hospital over in Japan and praying that she can eventually get back to be with her mother again. Um, also heard of another death that uh, Joy shared with me this morning. They lost another cousin. Jeff Meyer passed away, and that's a cousin of Jackie and Joy and Jeff Graham also. And so we ask your prayers for their family in another loss that they have has sustained this past week. And then, of course, we want to continue to pray for our military personnel, for Ellie's son-in-law, Spencer Ware, who's serving over in Kuwait, and for Terry's nephew, Abram Whitebird, who's also serving overseas, and those who are serving here in our nation, too. And for our missionary families, the Ulrichs in Malawi, the Magumbas in Uganda, and uh, Connie Wyke, who's serving here until she can return back to her missionary service over in China. So with those, let's join our hearts as we go to the Lord in prayer together this morning. Let's pray. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks today as we gather in this season of Lent and continue on our journey to the cross of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you sent him into this world to be our Savior and to give us the cleansing and forgiveness we need for our sins. And we pray that if there is anything in us that is keeping us from that relationship you desire to have with us, that you would point it out to us that we might confess it and that we might be cleansed and made pure and holy in your sight and continue to walk faithfully with you every day. 
Lord, uh, we give you thanks for those that we've lifted up who are receiving your healing power, healing from COVID and healing from cancer. And we continue to pray for those who struggle with these. Uh, we pray for the Curry family and give thanks that Ella's doing better. Pray that Avery gets through this well. And we pray for others that are in the midst of this battle. We pray for Susie's brother who's been in the hospital and is now off the ventilator. And we give you praise that he's doing better. Lord, uh, we pray for those with cancer and lift up Tammy to you again as she has begun her treatments. Uh, we lift up Charles who may have to have another surgery. We lift up all of our little ones, Owen and Lincoln and Emma and Maddie and pray for miracles in each of their lives of your healing power. We praise you that uh, Lincoln is doing well after his last therapy treatment and we pray that Maddie will continue to do well and they'll get good results from her scans and tests and just continue to work your healing in each of these little ones. Lord, be with our nation and be with our military personnel and we pray for your guidance for our leaders, from our president and vice president, uh, those in the Congress and Senate, the Supreme Court justices, all the way down to our local leaders, that they would lead us with wisdom and that they would see the needs of people and lead us all in the best way that is beneficial to all people. And be with uh, Spencer and Abram and others who are serving overseas. Keep them safe until they can return to their families. And be with those who serve in our nation as well and keep them safe where they are. We pray for relief from the, the rioting and the violence that we see in our nation. And we pray for you to guide us through this time. Lord, we lift up our missionary families and give you thanks for the work that they're doing, the Ulrichs in Malawi, the Magumbas in Uganda, uh, Connie, who's serving here until she can get back to China. And just thank you, Lord, for the opportunities they have to share the good news of Jesus wherever they are. And help us to do the same as we prepare for Holy Week and Easter coming up. May we be uh, reaching out to the people that we know that can join us for Easter services, either in person or on online or on the phone line, and just uh, put those names into our hearts as we pray for them and look for those opportunities to invite them to be with us. And we thank you so much for the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross that we continue to explore through this season and that he rose from the dead and has ascended and is our Lord and King forevermore. We praise you for all these things. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, even as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 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 We have some special music this morning, and Scott Allen is going to come and share that with us at this time. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art, 
How great thou art When through the woods And forest glades I wander And hear the birds Sing sweetly in the trees When I look down From lofty mountain grandeur And hear the brook And feel the gentle breeze Then sings my soul My Savior God to thee How great thou art How great thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to thee How great thou art How great thou art When Christ shall come With shout of acclamation And take me home What joy shall fill my heart Then I shall bow In humble adoration And there proclaim My God how great thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to thee How great thou art How great thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to thee How great thou art How great thou art Thank you so much Scott for sharing that special music with us this morning Our scripture lesson for today is in Mark chapter 15, verses 21 through 26, as we continue in our series at the cross. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. May God bless this reading and hearing of his word for today, for this is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Would you please join your hearts with me in prayer? Loving God, we thank you for these stories that we continue to explore through this season of those who were with Jesus at the cross or on the way to the cross. We thank you for the impact that he had on each person and that he continues to have on us today. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be at work in this time this morning to work in our hearts, to draw us closer to you, and to lift us up and encourage us as well as to challenge us in our living for you. We give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Well, there are a few things that happen in our lives that we might consider an inconvenience. When the truth is they are really pretty minor or what we might call first world problems. These might include getting a shopping cart with a rogue wheel that just will not go straight. Don't, doesn't that frustrate you? <laughs> or getting a popcorn shell stuck between your teeth or down in your gums. Or when the batteries in your TV remote are nearly dead so that you have to press really hard to get it to change the channel. Or go look for some new batteries. By the way, I can remember back in the day when my dad wanted to change the channel and I was the TV remote. (laughs) 
Now, these, these minor conveniences can be frustrating, but truly they are minor compared to what other people in the world have to face every day. In our journey to the cross of Jesus, we encounter a man who becomes an inconvenienced bystander. The first verse in our scripture today focuses on this man who is forced to become famous. Millions of people through the ages have labored and fought to get their names in the record of history. But Simon of Cyrene was pushed into the pages of history. Except for this one experience in his life, he would never have been known to us. But because of that one experience, he is known all over the world wherever the gospel of Jesus Christ is known. There's very little said about Simon in the Bible. In fact, just about everything we know about him is found in Mark 15, verse 21, and in one verse in Matthew and in Luke's Gospels, which are parallels to this one. We can speculate about who he was, and writers have done this down through the centuries. The song, Watch the Lamb, that Jason sings on Easter Sunday, is one songwriter's idea of the impact this encounter with Jesus had on Simon's life. This story, by the way, is not included in the little book At the Cross by Nelson Searcy and C.A. Meyer, which I'm using in this sermon series, and everyone will get a copy of that book at Easter or after Easter. So this is an extra blessing today as we share Simon's story. And the truth is, we never see Simon's name appear again in the scriptures, and we don't know what happened to him after this encounter with Jesus on the way to the cross. And I trust we can understand this as we consider what we can know about Simon from this one verse in Mark's gospel. So first, we know where he was from and what he was doing. Simon was from Cyrene one of the two largest towns in modern-day Libya in North Africa. With over 100,000 people at that time, it was a city in which many Jewish people lived. And so they would have had synagogues in that city that the Jewish people went to. And many of them would travel all the way to Jerusalem for the festivals of Passover and Pentecost. In the list of places in Acts chapter 2, from which people came to Jerusalem, and that passage that our youth never want to read on Confirmation Sunday, because the names are hard to pronounce, <laughs> we find Cyrene listed among the places. Simon was either a Jew or a proselyte, meaning a Gentile who had converted to Judaism, and he must have been very devoted in his belief in God for being willing to travel over 1,000 miles on probably foot, and maybe he had a horse or a donkey in order to get to Jerusalem to be able to worship God in the temple courts during the Passover season. But what he was doing when he was suddenly caught up in a moment that would change the whole direction of his life was simply passing by. He was an inconvenienced bystander, he knew nothing of all that had gone on in the city of Jerusalem the night before. Jesus had been going through the agonies in the Garden of Gethsemane, the mockery of a trial, and had endured the cruel mockings and beatings of the soldiers. Simon, no doubt, had been sleeping through all of that. He had just endured a long trip to get to Jerusalem and had a very long day planned as he went to offer a sacrifice at the temple. He was up early in the morning, had said his morning prayers, was dressed, and was almost into the city before 9 a.m. in the morning, when he suddenly became inconvenienced. Not only would he not be able to make it to the temple for the sacrifices, but now, because he had contact with Jesus' blood from the cross, he would be considered unclean, which meant he couldn't even get near the temple courts. If he had been a few minutes earlier or a few minutes later, or had gone a different route into the city, he never would have been in this situation, and we probably never would have heard of him. 
But now, he was to have an experience that morning that would change his entire life. He was to be a participant in God's ultimate act of love and grace through which God brought salvation to all who would believe in Jesus as Savior and give their lives to him. So my first question for you this morning is, when have you experienced a moment with Jesus that changed your life? And that brings us to the second thing we know about Simon. We know that he was compelled to carry the cross of Jesus. As Simon came near the city gate, he saw a crowd coming out of the city. They were shouting and mocking three men who were bearing crosses. One of them was having a difficult time, and it was obvious that he was holding up the procession. The soldiers who were anxious to get this over with ordered Simon to come and carry the cross of Jesus. The Roman soldiers had a right to compel a civilian to help them. In fact, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 41, Jesus said, If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. He was referring to the Roman law, which allowed a soldier to force someone to carry his pack for a mile. Why the soldiers picked Simon is really not known. We do know that Jesus had been up all night and had taken a severe beating before the cross was put upon his back. Therefore, it's quite likely that the traditional viewpoint, which is included in the 14 stations of the cross in the Roman Catholic Church, is probably true that Jesus stumbled and fell under the load of the cross. And I find it easy to believe an idea that is held by many that Jesus looked at Simon with a look of love and compassion that would transform Simon in that moment. Jesus had a power in his eyes to move the hearts of people. Just a few hours before, Jesus had moved another Simon, also called Peter, to tears of repentance by a mere glance after Peter had denied him three times. It's likely then that Simon of Cyrene was moved by a force within even as he was compelled from without to carry the cross. So when have you looked upon the face of Jesus? Maybe it's a special picture you have, or maybe it's in your imagination that you envision Jesus and seen the compassion in his eyes and had your heart moved. The third thing we know about Simon is that we know the consequences of his bearing the cross. It's also certain that through the, though the cross kept Simon from making it to the temple that morning, it brought him into a relationship with Jesus Christ. We believe he found it to be true that the way of the cross leads home, and that this inconvenience led him into a deeper faith. Why do we believe that Simon came to believe in Jesus as his Savior? Well, to understand this, since Simon is not mentioned again in the Bible, we have to look to his two sons who were with him there that day. Mark 15, 21 says that Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, why would Mark, who wrote his gospel mostly to reach the Gentiles, say that Simon was the father of these two boys, unless it was because these boys were known by the readers who received Mark's gospel. There would be no point in sharing these names unless they were well known among the early Christian community. Nor would their names be known if Simon had just disappeared in the crowd after reaching Golgotha. The other gospel writers who mentioned Simon in Matthew and Luke do not mention the names of his two sons. And this means that the sons of Simon must have been known by some in the Christian community. And we find this confirmed by Paul in his letter to the Romans, where he says in chapter 16, verse 13, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother who has been a mother to me too. So where did this Christian family come from? Well, Paul had not yet been to Rome when he wrote his letter to the Romans, 
So he must have met them somewhere along his journeys before they ended up in Rome. And if we put all these facts together, we see that not the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, but most likely Simon of Cyrene was the first convert to Christianity from the continent of Africa. And he went back home to his family and led them into a relationship with Jesus Christ. From there, they likely moved to Antioch. In Acts 13, verse 1, we read of prophets and teachers there, including some who had come from Cyrene. It was in Antioch where the followers of Jesus were called Christians for the first time. And it was from there that God called Paul and Barnabas to set out on their first missionary journey. Who knows how much this man, Simon, who carried the cross of Jesus, had to do with all of this. We don't know for sure, but if he was the first convert at the cross and became a leader where believers were first called Christians in Antioch, it would be there that Paul got to know this family as he spent time in Antioch before he set out on his missionary journeys. And later he was able to speak of Simon's son Rufus when he wrote his letter to the Christians in Rome. Now, there's much we do not know, but the things that we do know, which come from backing of many scholars, teach us to see that though Simon was compelled to carry the cross of Jesus for a while by the Roman soldiers, he chose to bear the cross for the rest of his life for his Savior. And as I think about the influence that Simon had on his two sons, it leads me to ask, how have you influenced your children and grandchildren in their relationship with the Lord? How have you carried the cross in your life? And what difference has that made in the lives of others in your circle of influence? And that brings us to the final thing that we can know about Simon. We know that his experience in carrying the cross was recorded in the scriptures for a purpose. In 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul wrote to Timothy, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And the story of Simon teaches us a lesson of major importance. It teaches us that cross-bearing is important in the lives of Christians. It teaches us what it really means. Today, the cross has become to many Nothing but a nice piece of jewelry that they wear around their neck or maybe on their lapel. And there's nothing wrong with wearing a cross as a symbol like this, but there may be something wrong if we don't look at it the right way. The experience of Simon teaches us to think of the cross as being identified That means to be identified openly with Jesus. And if people would mock Jesus for who he was, they will mock Christians as well. Jesus told his disciples as he was preparing to go to the cross, in this world you will have trouble. Christians are not exempt from that trouble. But he went on to say to them, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's why it's not an easy task sometimes to talk about Jesus as it is to talk about the weather or sometimes it's even easier to talk about politics with someone else than to talk about Jesus. It's difficult to be identified with Jesus and his cross in some of our circles. Bearing the cross is not the same kind of suffering one goes through because of an injury or illness or weakness in the body is what Paul would refer to as a thorn in the flesh, not a cross. The cross is only taken up when we are so identified with Jesus Christ that people will feel and act toward us as they did toward him. If a person loves Jesus, he or she will also likely love you if you share your love for Jesus. If a person despises Jesus, 
he or she will likely also despise you whenever you mention his name. This means that Jesus expects us every day to be so identified with him that it costs us something to be a Christian. It's easy to be a Christian if we don't have to take up a cross, but without the cross, we do not really grasp the meaning of what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. How often do we want to follow Jesus, but don't want it to cost us anything? It should be that we experience some measure of discomfort because of our identification with Jesus Christ. Leslie Weatherhead, who was a missionary to India in the early part of the 20th century, had an Indian Christian tell him of what it cost him to follow Jesus Christ. And it put Leslie to shame when he considered how little he had identified himself with the cross of Jesus in such a way that it would cost him anything. This Indian friend heard the call of Jesus Christ to come to him in a Methodist church in Madras, India. He came from a Brahmin family, and his father was the head of that community. When his father heard of his decision to follow Jesus, he blazed with anger. He tied his son to a pillar in the courtyard of his home, stripped the turban from his head, which was a mark of indignity in the Hindu religion, and then lashed his back with a whip until the blood ran. And then he left him there to stand in the hot sun for hours. They even poured the contents of the sewage bin that they used in their bathroom for, um, you know what for, <laughs> they poured that over his head as a symbol of degradation. They put two large scars on his face with red-hot irons. His own mother died of shock in front of him as she was witnessing the pain that he was enduring there. And finally, his sister had compassion and cut him loose, and he escaped to the hills, and eventually he became a chaplain in the Indian Army. Many have suffered the same thing for crimes against their nation in India, but when it is suffered because one is identified with Jesus Christ, that is what it means to bear the cross. Now, it's likely that in our, na in our nation, we're never going to be asked to go to that extreme of bearing a cross and, and suffering physical infliction because of it. But there may be times when our Christianity is put down by others or even the government tries to restrict our Christian freedoms in this land. It's happening in other places. Why not here? But the story of Simon of Cyrene is recorded for the purpose of challenging each of us to take up our cross and be identified with Jesus, whatever the cost may be. So one final question for you this morning. How is God calling you to take up a cross to follow Jesus today. Amen. And let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for this story of Simon of Cyrene, even though it is a very, very short story in one verse. We thank you for the, the history and the tradition and the, the references of his sons in other places in the Bible that connect the dots for us and help us to see the impact that carrying the cross of Jesus made upon Simon's life. We pray that we may be willing to take up our cross every day, to be bold in our witness for Jesus wherever we are, to invite others to come on this journey with us, and especially on Easter Sunday when we remember that Jesus came back from the dead after his suffering on the cross, and that he was resurrected, and that we can have that new life in us as well. Challenge us to go forth this morning and to see how you call us to carry a cross for you in our world today. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Well, as we close this morning, I want to just remind you uh, of a few things. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and uh, we will have palms, but we're not going to have a palm procession this year, unfortunately. But uh, we also remind you to 
fill out a card and uh, put it in the basket in the back for Harriet Evans or Mary Rogers or both if you choose to, to cheer up their day a little bit. And then reminder too that uh, we're doing flower signups. If you want to provide flowers for worship, get a slip off of the, the uh, board by the offices or call Judy and get your flower order in. Um, I forgot to mention at the beginning, the Sunday school is meeting uh, junior and senior high in person and the community of viral disciples is meeting in person. So if you want more information on that one, contact Judy Houck. And then for Easter, uh, read the letter that came this week and get that postcard or uh, contact us in some way, send the postcard back or send an email or a text message or um, leave a message on the church phone and let us know your plan for Easter Sunday if you want to come to church in person that day. We can have up to 70 people at each service and we will do some cleaning in between. <laughs> and we also are having the Easter egg hunt for the younger kids on that day. And, uh, and then the Easter dinner following the 1030 service that day. So let us know if you plan to participate in any of those. And then please do continue reading with me in the Bible reading plan through Hebrews and Galatians through the rest of this month. So with that, I thank you for being with us in worship today. And I hope that you have a great week. Let's have our closing prayer. Loving God, just guide and direct us as we go forth today to continue on our journey to the cross and to be at the cross with Jesus and to bear a cross for Jesus in our daily lives. Guide us to be strong witnesses for you wherever we may be. We give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you all for being with us in worship today. And I wish you God's blessings and have a great week. God bless.